Welcome to Dylan Loper Talks to You and Vice Versa, Project Nerd's first late night talk show. I am, of course, Dylan Loper. We've got a fantastic episode tonight. Jason Trost is in the house. But first, let's read today's Garfield. <laughs> Darn cat. Uh, my first and only guest has made movies such as the FP. All Superheroes Must Die, and most recently, FP for Evs. Let's welcome Jason Trust. Hey, hello. Hey, this, will, this will probably have, like, a, a, I'll put some, in post, some applause here, so we'll just wait for the applause to die down. Sure. And there we go. Hi, Jason. Welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Good. Hey, no problem. Uh, so you got a new f- uh, film, uh, FP for Evs, came out. Yeah, I do. It's uh, Here it's the... I suppose finale of the FP franchise, but not necessarily the end of the FP universe. I don't know. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. But how long have you been working on the the most recent one? Oh gosh, um, FP four. I started way back, like right before the pandemic began. We started doing <laughs> FP three and four back to back, which then kind of like changed up the shooting style. From it was going to be more practical, and then like as the pandemic became more and more of a real thing, we're like. How about some more green screen? How about some more green screen? Actually, we're just going to do this mostly green screen now because we're essentially quarantining together with like our four person crew and just not going out. And then fled the country, moved to Australia, and we've been doing post effects and those for like two years during the pandemic here in an apartment. And now I'm free. It's over. Nice, man. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you doing in the Sydney, Australia? Uh, my my wife, Chai T. Talay, she lives here in Sydney, and we'd always kind of planned to move here, and we were planning for about six months to relocate from America, and then right two weeks before we were planned to move, the pandemic hit, and we couldn't have picked a better time. Seriously, that's like <laughs> damn good timing, all right, like time, peace out. It was really down to the wire. I remember the last day of shooting, we got a call from Talay's mom, and she's like, if you guys don't leave in three days, you're not getting in the country, because they really shut down the borders there, and it was intense, so... We had two weeks initially after the movie to like pack up our lives and move across the world, and that turned into three days, and it was, it was a lot. Work, works better on like a on a time crunch. You know? Oh yeah, it's, absolutely. It's better on that kind of thing. Packing a house so. up in three days and shipping two animals was, was a lot. <laughs> I want to talk about the FP. I recently just watched that, and uh, it was. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse. I know people are going to watch this. I, I will try my my darndest not to curse because it's a fucking problem for me. Oh, please. But it was, it was You've seen it was pretty it was pretty fucking sweet, man. Like uh, I just want to know how you did all of that on such like a budget because it it was it was really good. Like how how you got all of these things together, like sets and locations and all that thing, like. How, how did how did you get to that? Are we talking which FP are we talking about? FP, FP one. We're talking about the first one. Oh, yeah, we'll go with FP one. Going way back. Um, well, God, it was like twenty years ago at this point. Uh, yeah, it wasn't that long. It was, but no, it's getting there. Uh, we, uh, I mean, that was just like favors, like because I grew up in the real life Fraser Park, and it was just a satirical piss take on that town and how the kids acted there. Like it's pretty much verbatim shining a mirror on that age group. It was very particular, like early two thousands, like kids watching bad boys and just thinking oh well, i was gonna say like a bunch of white kids, wait. yeah watching their like yeah Bay and bad boys and whatever and like listening to their you know dr dre and their dmx and they just kind of took kind on of a persona that wasn't quite theirs and like we're gonna do yeah it's like street i'm like there are no streets it's dirt roads come on guys it it took me a bit to understand that i was like oh wait they're like talking like 2000 like white boy gangsters i'm like this yeah. is brilliant i love it yeah definitely a time capsule for that particular yeah. time in all of our youth um but yeah, so I grew up there, so obviously I knew a lot of the people and the things. So it's like getting locations and things like that. It was definitely like right for what I knew I had access to at that point. That's kind of like famously until, you know, FP3 and 4 with all this green screen nonsense. Um, I always would write for like something I knew I had. Like I'm not going to write a movie about a spaceship if I don't have access to one. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, I'm like, well, I got access to like a white trash town and some post-apocalyptic looking junk on my dad's property we'll write something around that and then the fp was yeah one. and yeah it's just it's pretty much like everything you see i wrote be and i'm like well we have cave walls my dad got those from some movie he was working on i guess we can have a cave <laughs> stuff like that, that you just kind of like build into it with what you have and i just yeah, work with what you got. weird silly stuff and art shit and we're cursing and there you are what was like your biggest i want to say influence or push to be like i want to be a filmmaker i want to try to 
dabbled in this? I mean, I just grew up in it, so it was kind of like inevitable as in my blood because, like, my dad works in the film business, my grandparents work in the film business, great grandparents. Like, it is, it's just been forever. It's kind of like, you know, someone was like, my dad was a fireman. No, I'm a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> like there wasn't some like aha moment where it's like I'm gonna do it was just kind of assumed that I'm just gonna be a part of it because I'm growing up on sets and like everyone in my you know orbit at that point in my life worked in the movies so it's kind of like oh well everyone else works in the movies I guess I will too and then I was like oh I like making movies and he started banging GI Joes together on set in my dad's effects truck and like the VHS camera and then that progressed I remember the aha moment of like oh my god I really want to do that was when I saw Terminator 2 in theaters at four years old and I was just like, holy shit, what is this? And then, yeah, that's, I think that's probably when, like, I need to make these happen. But I didn't really quite know what that feeling meant until later. But if I had to track it, that would be it. I mean, that's Cameron at his finest. Yeah. He, he peaked after that one. So it's just like, why bother? I mean, come on. Do you think your uh, family would have been disappointed if you went to be like, I don't want to be in the film industry. I want to be a lawyer or I want to be a firefighter. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe my the life one to break the chain. It would have been a lot. My life would have been a lot more stable, which I'm sure they might have enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> With an actual like, you know, nine to five like guaranteed job all the time. Yep. Instead of like, oh, oh man, yeah. I worked the most intense period you can probably work in your life for three months. And I didn't work again for a year. Like that, it's the movie business is bizarre. That's weird. Yeah, you don't really think about that part of the movie business. It's always like that image in your head of like, oh, they're constantly working. They're constantly making movies, but there's, and I'm assuming, people, a lot of downtime. It can be. Like, if you're like The Rock or something, I'm sure you don't even have a spare minute. But like, if you're not The Rock, then there is a lot of downtime. And even with me, when I'm making these movies, like, you know, I get to spend about two or three weeks with my buddies, like shooting it and, you know, prepping, doing all those things, which is great. And then there's like about a year of post where I go home and it's just me and the computer. And, you know, even though like I'm working like a nine to five every day without my own, it's still like it can be a very solitary experience at that point. So it's yeah. You know. Do you edit all your own stuff too? Or? Yeah. It's just, I kind of I have to to a point because like the way I write it and shoot it and everything and like it's because of how I know I'll edit it because I know like what I have and what I can do. I'm, I'm a big proponent of like knowing what I'm going to do with it in the back end. So I'm just shooting it and seeing what happens. Like there's a degree of that, but like, I know what I can get away with rather. Like, I know like if I shoot something like that, it'll lead to this. Like I like to kind of compare shooting movies to cooking a bit because it's like a lot of it. Like I find that like the writing process is basically writing your recipe or finding your recipe. And I feel like the uh, shooting process is like gathering your ingredients and post-production is actually where you cook and make the meal because you know, I feel like post is where a lot of the magic comes in. And, you know, I'm certain yeah. people will shoot me on this because like, oh, shooting's the best part. It's so stressful and hard and weird and strange. And it's such a blur, but like, you're just trying to gather as many ingredients as you can so you can finesse and cook later when you have the time. And like, I don't know, I feel like when you get to the pro level, nine out of 10 people will probably give you about the same ingredients, but it's what you do with them when you're cooking that actually makes the movie work. Because like what music you use, how you edit it, what, you know, it takes you, all that is where comes alive so there's gonna be you know some filmmakers amateur filmmakers aspiring filmmakers watching this what is the best tips and tricks that you personally have learned that you could pass on to people that would help them out yeah that's a good question uh i mean obviously there's the one i think is obvious like listen to your gut like when you make these movies you're gonna have a lot of people in years being like you should do this you should do that and it's like all right cool but you have to just stick to it and do what you know you want to do. That's like an obvious one for me. Uh, I don't know. Be nice to people. There's a lot of people like they start doing movies and they become just egotistical monsters. Like just remember, like you have a crew of people that are probably your friends and family and uh, they're donating their time. You be nice to them because the nicer you are to them, the harder they'll work for you. Um, another one, a big one, I think for me is never hire the best person, hire the person who wants to be there the most. Because I've seen more so many times that someone's like, oh, my God, we've got the best DP in the world. But he's just a total diva asshole. And it makes the whole set a nightmare. Hire the person who wants to be there the most and put in the most work and loves the project as much as you do. Even if they've never done anything before, you're going to get a much better performance or much better work out of them as a crew member. It's going to be more creative. Everything's going to be better because there's so many jaded people. Like, don't listen to that. Don't get, like, the... The, the, you know, the Hollywood eyes in there and like, oh, we have to use him. He's the best. And it's like, and he cost the most. Now he took 90% of your budget and you have no money to make the movie. But, you know, that's a thing. Uh, write for what you know you have. Like I was saying earlier, you know, if you don't have access to a spaceship, you don't know how to build like a miniature one or something, like just don't put it in your 
movie. If there's a sewer across the street that, you know, is on your dad's property or something, be like, all right, let's make a movie about a sewer. So it's, you know, it's those kind of things like, you know, and a lot of people, they're always like, oh, man, when you catch the next movie, let me know. And I'm like, well, I kind of already write the movie for who I know can be in it. They're like my rogues gallery of friends at this point. Because, like, again, that's a surprise. At least when you're making something low budget, it's hard to be like, God, I hope somebody can do this Leonardo DiCaprio performance in this movie. I wrote it for that. I hope we find him. You're probably not in a low budget movie. You're going to find somebody who can do that. So write it for people you know can do certain things. And that's always, you know, helped me at this point. Um, gosh, what else? What else? Crowdfunding is your friend, obviously, because uh, whenever you do that thing where it's like, especially now, like trying to recoup your money on low budget movies is so hard that when you're like, oh, my, we're going to take out a loan for $100,000 and we're going to hit it big. And then it's like, uh, be careful, guys. Try not to spend your own money if you can help it. Don't listen to your producers like, we have to shoot this thing on red or Alexa and we need to like go rent this camera. It's going to cost us $50,000. Like the prosumer cameras, the DSLRs are great now. It's almost indistinguishable. Like don't listen to someone that says you need to have the best camera. You don't. It's about what you put in front of the camera and not what camera you use. And that's Ooh. a pretty big one. I like that quote. We'll put yeah. that on the bottom of the screen. Go. <laughs> Do you want to talk about your, your new movie? You're working on are you allowed to yeah yeah not a lot i'm gonna i'm probably gonna have a crowdfunder coming out in like a week or two for that so i guess it's about time to start talking about it a little bit um let's get some juicy gossip going on it's called the waves of madness and it's definitely a lovecraftian fuck yeah uh very loosely inspired by call of cthulhu and it's a kind of a fake one shot where the whole movie is played out like a black and white side scrolling video game where it's like the whole thing you just see from a side scrolling angle. So it's like, you know, what was that war movie like 1917? Like, so oh, like yeah. all one shot, but it's kind of like that, but from a side scrolling angle, which will be fun. And it takes place in the middle of the ocean on this cruise ship that goes horribly off course and shit happens. That's a fucking bonkers idea. So, yeah. like, okay, I'm going to break. Sorry, I got to sure. break this down now because I really enjoy this. So, like, did you like. Wes Anderson, it like cut the ship in half, kind of a thing, or you like you? What do you use? Like, I'm building. Green screen? That's what um. It's all green screen because it has to be because I have to build all the sets like levels that all slot and clink together. Like if you pan out, it basically becomes like a Metroidvania map of what oh. the whole ship would be, and all these different little panels of sets that link together with their moving elements and like because I'm also it's between that I'm also very inspired with FP3 and 4, but with this one too, like the old PlayStation 1 era, like pre-rendered graphics, mm. would make those cool backgrounds where it's technically, it's like moving Photoshop kind of stuff. I really have always liked that. I was gonna do a lightning round questions, but I already asked you some of these, so we're gonna have to make some of them up to go. It's right. the Dylan Loper talks to you, vice versa, lightning round. <sighs> Graphic of lightning or something. We'll yeah. figure that out in post. I'm bad with lightning, see what happens. All right, lightning round. Uh, right, we already did favorite director, uh, least favorite director. Jesus, least favorite director. Oh, that's kind of, that's kind of mean, but uh, <laughs> let's go for the cutthroat in this show. God, man, okay, this is gonna blow my mind because uh, I, I do have some for sure. Um, I was trying to think of something that actually like really upset me. That's a movie. Um, I'm, I'm I'm blanking. Pixar or DreamWorks? Uh, early Pixar. Ants or Bugs Life? Shit, I mean. I used to say ants when I was a kid because I loved it. It had Stallone in it, but now I feel like Woody Allen would annoy the shit out of me. You know, maybe that maybe that's my least favorite director, Woody Allen. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's get back to it. Yeah, fuck ants. Fucking second that one. Thank you, sir. Oh yes. Uh, are you a data or data person? How do you say it? Uh, I guess data because again, going back to James Cameron, how in True Lies, when Charlton Heston says, "Do you have any hot data?" Taco Bell or Del Taco. Ooh, um, it depends. Depends on what my budget is. Depends on what time of the night it is. If I just like want to appreciate some like bad taco, a good bad, I'll go to Taco Bell. But if it's like two or three in the morning, and there's that quantity factor of I need twenty tacos for like fifty cents a piece, we're going Del Taco because I can also slip a cheeseburger in there with fries. Uh, mug or A and W? Mug or A and W? Ah, oh, fuck. A uh, and W. What would you rate this show on a scale of one to two? Uh, two point one. Ooh, oh shit thank you sir yeah, that's yeah. very generous two that one. very generous you got a two one fp for evs is that out now yeah it's out in america it's coming out like i guess like territory by territory slowly but surely around the world 
because XYZ is releasing this one. So they've got their whole their whole plan. I'm kind of like just along for the ride. I get an email every once in a while, like, we need this for Canada or something. All right, you can have it. Send. Uh, I must uh, check it out on Prime, right? You can you can watch it on yeah, Prime. It's on Prime. It's on. It's on everything. It's like Prime, iTunes, Vudu, blah blah blah. It's coming to Tubi eventually, I hear. So nice. One check two, it three out, are on FP one through three are on Tubi now. If you want to catch up, and then I get like a, a dime every time you watch it. So let's do it. Uh, yeah, go check out FP four Fs. I need to watch the other three before i watch this one because i mean i'm sure there's references unless yeah. it is like an indiana jones can i jump into four you can't there is, there, with four there is a uh thing at the beginning of the movie that will catch you up oh, that's like, yeah. previously on but uh yeah. you know you could watch two and three and get some more out of it for sure because yeah. two three and four are more connected like one's kind of like the hobbit and then two three four like the lord of the rings of the fp franchise thank you for uh, coming on my very shitty show i appreciate sure, thanks it. for having me yeah um you can check his movie out on amazon prime or wherever you can find it yeah, and, please do. Uh, google yeah. it google it's easy as that folks just google fucking it. google it yeah uh but yeah for dylan loper talks to you and vice versa i have of course dylan loper and we'll see if i'm canceled after this episode hopefully see you next time we don't know good day.